I'm going to talk a little bit about SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, but more broadly, uh, I want to talk about the SETI Institute. So I'm actually wearing two hats here today. Uh, one is my SETI Institute hat and one is my Berkeley SETI Research Center hat, but we're really all sort of one big happy family in the SETI community. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background about what the SETI Institute does, um, talk a little bit about the work that I do specifically, and then you know I'm happy to take questions and to refer questions out to some of my other colleagues that are here this morning. SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, uh, began in its modern form at the Green Bank Observatory in 1959 uh, with the Project Ozma search that was done by Frank Drake, uh, who was, I think, uh, 29 years old at the time. Um, Frank sadly just passed away uh, earlier this year, um, but he was really one of the pioneers in the field, also somebody who was very much involved with the SETI Institute from its foundation. Uh, and also around the same time, NASA uh, and the, the National Science Foundation um, were, or the, I guess the National Academy of Sciences, I'm sorry, were, were beginning uh, to consider the possibility of life beyond Earth. And this was back in the day when we really didn't know um, very much about the possibilities for life um, in our solar system or outside our own solar system. There's a lot more data that we have now that's really driving uh, the modern search for life beyond Earth. So yeah, as I say, um, Frank, uh, Project Ozma took place at the Green Bank Observatory, uh, and um, Frank really had a long and illustrious career. Um, there's a lot of memorials if you want to go online and look in the media um, since he passed away uh, a week or two ago. Um, really, really incredible guy who was a mentor um, to the younger generation as well, uh, and uh, he, he really will be missed. So another thing that happened in the early 1960s, again at the Green Bank Observatory, was Frank put together uh, what's now known as the Drake Equation, which really was an attempt to parameterize what we know about the possibilities for life beyond Earth. Um, so there's this number N on the left, Drake's N, uh, the number of technological civilizations that exist, um, in this case in our own galaxy. And Frank multiplied these numbers together on the right, so there's the rate of formation of stars in the galaxy, there's the fraction of those stars that have planets, uh, the number of Habitable, habitable worlds, uh, so sort of could be Earth-like planets per system that has planets, the fraction of those on which life arises, the fraction of planets with life on which intelligence arises, the fraction of planets with intelligence uh, that develop technology, communications technology specifically, which obviously is uh, you know, the interest um, in, in the room here today, and the duration that that technology persists for. And so, uh, you know, we've had radio technology for about 100 years. You could put um, the uh, L equals 100 on the right. And then all of those other numbers, so R star is sort of of order 1, FP, we now know, we didn't know back in the 1960s, but we now know that um, pretty much uh, every uh, star has, has planets. And probably the number of sort of habitable worlds per system is around 1. So there's these uh, whoops, there's these three numbers, I guess, uh, right, but this is sort of saying what I just said. Every, every star in the sky has one or more planets. Um, many of them are Earth size. About 20% of, uh, 20 of them are rocky, habitable zone worlds, so the right distance from their star where liquid water could exist on the surface. And so there's maybe 10 to 60 billion, depending on the, the numbers, uh, the exact numbers, Earth like planets in this habitable zone where liquid water could exist on the surface in our galaxy alone, and that's not even accounting for other galaxies. So there's a lot of real estate out there, and the question is, you know, does life arise where you have the conditions and the ingredients? Um, so I mentioned this already. We know these three numbers um, on, on that are with check marks on the left here, and then we really don't know these, these other numbers here. Um, you know, are we going to have technology that persists that's detectable for a long period of time? And what are the chances that life and intelligence and communication arises on planets where the conditions are suitable? So this is really what we're trying to find out. And in particular, in the context of the SETI Institute, um, it's not just a focus on the communicating technology, it's a focus on the habitability uh, and um, the, the fraction of, of planets where life arises and really sort of synthesizing all of these fields in modern astronomy and astrophysics that enables us to address these questions. Um, so just uh, to sort of put things on the map here, so I'm based at UC Berkeley at the Berkeley SETI Research Center. Uh, I also have, again, another hat that I wear, which is my affiliation with the SETI Institute. Um, there's a few of us at Berkeley SETI who also have SETI Institute affiliations. Uh, and then some of you are familiar, I know, with the Allen Telescope Array, which is the uh, 42 element um, uh, antenna array. These are six meter uh, antennas that are based up at the Hat Creek Radio Observatory, about a four hour drive north of the San Francisco Bay Area. And I know several of you in this room have been uh, out to, to Hat Creek and out to the ATA for a hackathon that we had there. We're hoping to do that again, um, perhaps in 2023. And I know there's been a lot of interest at this meeting as we're sort of 
coming out of the, um, the the sort of acute phase of the pandemic. Um, I, I hope we'll be able to get folks together again up there and really get hands on. It's a really fun place to go and um, sort of fun to be able to roll up your sleeves and actually plug stuff into a radio telescope, which um, we're going to have a keynote from from Tony Beasley um, from the, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory tomorrow. And uh, the, the barrier to sort of um, playing around with Tony's telescopes is, is a little higher than it is to, to playing around with ours. We're a little bit more kind of roll up your sleeves and, and plug stuff in. And we actually have um, some USRPs that are plugged into the back of the telescope there that you can play around with. Um, so again, just to sort of make the distinction uh, with Berkeley SETI and Breakthrough Listen, the other hat that I wear. Um, so I'm the project scientist for Breakthrough Listen on the Green Bank Telescope. This is at the Green Bank Observatory where Frank's experiment started in the 1960s. Uh, but the Green Bank Telescope is a, a really huge single dish. It's a 100-meter um, single dish. It's about 7,000 tons of moving parts. If you get the chance to go out to Green Bank, West Virginia, and, and check it out, it's really cool. Um, and, uh, you know, again, this is sort of a telescope that is uh, it, it's scheduled um, sort of pretty, uh, I don't want to say aggressively, but, um, you know, the, the, there's there's not a lot of, it's, it's hard to get time on the Green Bank Telescope. It's hard to sort of play around um, with, with the Green Bank Telescope. And so a lot of the sort of prototyping work and a lot of the kind of pioneering um, work that we're doing in driving the technology forward, that technology development is taking place up at the ATA. Uh, I keep on saying I wear a lot of hats. The other hat that I wear is uh, I run our undergraduate research program. And actually, uh, Shane Smith there, who's in the audience uh, now at Aerospace, is a graduate of our uh, research experience for undergraduates program. So if you want the real kind of, um, you know, honest opinion from, from Shane, then uh, go and catch him at the coffee break and, uh, you know, do refer your undergrads to us as well. Um, I think uh, we, we have a, a fun time with them for a 10 week paid summer research internship. The SETI Institute also runs um, an REU program. So again, our focus is more on um, sort of the, the radio uh, uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, a little bit of optical searches. Uh, the SETI Institute's REU is broader, sort of covering life in the universe and all the other work that goes on at the SETI Institute as well. So I mentioned the Allen Telescope Array. Uh, this is wholly run and operated by, by SETI. Uh, and, um, you know, again, 42 six-meter dishes. Uh, and the SETI Institute, um, uh, you know, as I already said, basically is leading, um, uh, this is sort of the mission statement, humanity's quest to understand the origins and prevalence of life and intelligence in the universe, and also to share this knowledge to inspire present and future generations. Uh, and maybe, um, Rebecca, if you just wait, ra raise your hand in the back there. So Rebecca McDonald, who's the uh, communications uh, lead at the SETI Institute, is, is here as well, and we'll be happy to talk to you about that and about um, you know the other sort of, uh, some of the other things that I'm gonna talk about today. So this really sort of comes under this umbrella of this question, are we alone? And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, this is something that the uh, National Academies were looking at even as early as the late 1950s. There was a little sort of blip in the, the 80s and 90s, actually more of kind of a big blip when people uh, in Congress decided that this sort of little green men hunt was a, an easy target to, to have its funding cut. And it's taken a while to sort of rebuild the credibility of the field. And again, the fact that we now know that there are planets everywhere in our own galaxy um, has, I think, kind of made this seem a little bit more like a proper scientific field that's open for investigation as opposed to sort of the tinfoil hat brigade kind of, um, you know, waving a, a, a coat hanger around somewhere in the middle of a, a field. So we now have the tools and the technology to find out. And again, um, you know, uh, NASA uh, has Mini Cooper-sized robots driving around on Mars. I'm sure you've all seen the images from the James Webb Space Telescope, which is uh, one of its primary missions is to look for signs of biology, so-called biosignatures in the atmospheres of planets around other stars. And then by extension from biosignatures, uh, you know, there's also been a little bit of rebranding in the SETI field um, uh, uh, to, to um, term this technosignature searches. So biosignatures looking for biology, technosignatures looking for technology. And I'm, I'm sure I don't have to tell folks in this room that, you know, the Earth is detectable. Um, it's, the Earth's technology is detectable. Um, actually, you know, the Earth outshines the sun at some radio wavelengths, uh, you know, in narrow bands. So if you're looking uh, with a large antenna from, from a large distance away, then it will be pretty obvious that, um, that the Earth was inhabited by a technological civilization. Another interesting point, there's a great uh, paper that came out um, recently by one of our colleagues at Penn State, Jason Wright. And Jason makes the point that, you know, if you were uh, an alien visiting the solar system, you'd find there's only one world that we're aware of that has biology, but there's actually several worlds that have technology. And it's the technology that we've sent out there, our space probes, we've got, you know, the rovers that are driving around on Mars. Um, so you'd actually see signs of technology on, on more than one planet are on, in our own solar system. And if you sort of factor that back into the Drake equation and you factor the longevity of that te technology, um, maybe the technology isn't 
uh, still operating, but you know the Apollo sites on the moon are going to be around for a long while, maybe even after a lot of evidence that's here on Earth uh, has been sort of erased by the the weather and plate tectonics and all this kind of stuff. So um, you know it's not clear that uh, that biosignatures are necessarily the the winning horse in this race. Um, you know if you want to sort of bet on on one or the other, then I think um, you know the jury's still out as as to which is uh, the best way forward. And again. You know, I do want to emphasize the SETI Institute, uh, you know, is, is doing sort of aspects of, of all of the above, not just the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So the SETI Institute is organized um, under uh, these sort of three primary missions, uh, the, the research mission to explore, the education mission to inspire, and then a broader kind of outreach uh, program to engage. And there's a lot of great outreach that's going on. Um, there's, uh, I think that's maybe, no, it's in a later slide. Um, I'll come back to that. Uh, but just to give you some sort of facts and figures about the SETI Institute, many of you are familiar, uh, I'm sure, at least, um, uh, you know, Jill Tarter um, probably rings a bell. Um, Jill Tarter and Tom Pearson founded the SETI Institute um, sort of out of a kind of Silicon Valley mindset, really, in NASA Ames Research Center in 1984. Uh, there's now, um, I'm not sure whether this is quite up to date, but there's uh, over 90 PhD research scientists and uh, around 50 research affiliates. 10 professional staff in education, communications, and outreach. And again, uh, you know, Rebecca can tell you a lot about that. They've supported um, this, this meeting uh, as well, um, you know, providing, uh, I think you've all got the logo um, on, on your badge uh, that was uh, designed by the designers at the SETI Institute. So, you know, there's some real good resources that we can tap into as the GNU radio community here as well. Uh, $25 million annual operating budget. And a lot of that comes from federal grants and contracts. And I'll, I'll mention again briefly later that if you're interested in uh, becoming a principal investigator with the SETI Institute, again, you know, Rebecca can, um, can give you information about how to do that. Uh, SETI Institute's the prime contractor to NASA for planetary protection. I mentioned they manage and operate the, the ATA, administer and manage education programs in partnership with NASA and the National Science Foundation, formal and informal curriculum materials for education programs, and a real active program in public outreach to share our science with the general public. So here's some of the uh, sort of um, leading figures at the SETI Institute. So uh, I mentioned Rebecca uh, already, um, Andrew Simeon, who's also my boss at Berkeley, again, sort of somebody who wears two hats as the director of the SETI research program uh, at the SETI Institute. And, you know, again, some other folks that you might have uh, uh, seen here, particularly Seth Shostak is very active in, in the education program. Uh, you know, so all these folks are available, um, you know, to support um, and, and help manage uh, grants and other programs. And, and again, we'd really encourage you. Th there's been some talk about um, the sort of organizational aspects of this, which I won't really touch on now. But GNU Radio is now, um, you know, under the umbrella of the SETI Institute. And so, you know, you here in this room have access to, to these resources to help um, support your work. Uh, a lot of funding sources, again, a lot of it is, uh, as I say, through, through contracts and grants. Um, this is just a sampling of the folks that uh, have, have funded the work going on at the SETI Institute. Um, and uh, so, th again, sort of a, a way to break this down, really, in, in terms of this question, are we alone in the universe, is to take this into these three domains, the structure of the universe, planets and habitability, life, complexity, and intelligence, and then breaking this down into six disciplines that we use to address this, astrophysics, exoplanets, planetary explore, exploration, astrobiology, climate and geoscience, and then the search again for technosignatures, which is um, sort of my area of expertise. So um, SETI Institute supports research across the natural sciences, again, not just SETI, uh, NASA science mission support, field expeditions, lab research, ground-based uh, astronomy observations in radio and optical, space-based operation observations, Hubble, Kepler, TESS, um, some of these NASA missions, technology and instrumentation development, advanced data analytics and data management. And we explore to understand stellar and planetary evolution, planetary environments and habitability, the nature and origins of life, and the evolution of intelligence and technology. And I mean, these are really sort of pretty broad topics. And again, um, you know, this, this technology, the technosignature work in particular, the work going on at the Allen Telescope Array, I think is sort of what's most relevant for the folks in this room. And it really is kind of hands-on um, you know, DSP, plugging stuff into to antennas, um, anomaly detection, time series, uh, uh, data streams, um, high-performance computing. You know, there's a lot of stuff where I think we can kind of work together and, and do good stuff. Um, so, you know, a, a day at the office can involve, um, you know, some pretty, pretty varied topics and some pretty varied uh, different subjects that, that this breaks down into and the interrelationship between all of those subjects as well. So I mentioned um, the, the work going on at the Allen Telescope Array and particularly the hackathon 
that again, some of you in this room will recognize yourselves uh, in this this photo. You can go and read uh, the sort of um, the the report from this meeting that we had up there. For those of you that have been up to the ATA, uh, and oh, I will say, if you're going to come up to the ATA, then uh, you know there's going to be a sort of rat's nest of cables because there's no Wi-Fi uh, up there um, because you don't want to interfere with the observations. So you've got to plug in uh, over Ethernet into some big switches. But for from those of you who remember um, the the signal processing room at the ATA, which was also a rat's nest at the time that you came up there, uh, the the new director who moved in, Alex Pollack, has really kind of reorganized that. And I think, uh, you know, not just in terms of the, um, you know, how nice it looks in there now and how well organized it looks, but also in terms of the performance of the antennas uh, and and the work that's going on. And I, I'm not sure whether, um, is Wael in the audience here? Let's see, Wael. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. Okay. So we got some of the, some of the crew from the ATA here. Wael Farrar, um, who is uh, one, of, one of the scientists up here, um, Luigi Cruz. Uh, who I think many of you know, um, sort of fr from his work in Guinea Radio, but but has also um, been working up there, and Sebastian Obenberger, um, who are all there at the back. And if you want to go chat with them about the ATA and sort of ways to get involved there as well, I'm sure they'd be happy to chat with you about that. Um, so you know, Gnu Radio at the ATA again has sort of come on in leaps and bounds. Really, I think sort of um, uh, initiated at that um, that hackathon that we had. But there's been folks working on that, including. Some undergraduate students who have actively been developing the program, uh, and um, I, I'd be remiss as well if I didn't mention Daniel Estevez, who's been doing really amazing work with the ACA. You should check out his blog and some of the work that he's been doing for an idea of the capabilities uh, that the ACA has and that the GNU Radio backend that the ACA has. Um, it really, uh, you know, it's it's a sea change from what it was a few years back. Um, I mentioned our undergraduate programs, so both the, uh, the Berkeley and SETI Institute um, undergraduate research programs take the students up to the ATA. They get some hands-on training, again, led by, uh, by, by Danny Estevez and, and by Derek Kozell um, in the use of GNU Radio more generally, and then they get to sort of transfer that hands-on to actually plugging into the back of the telescope and doing some radio telescope observations. So I think this is really uh, you know, a great program, and again, we'd, we'd welcome more involvement with that. Um, so uh, Danny has some materials that he developed for um, the, the REU program. Uh, there's also uh, some videos, which I, I've been remiss in getting uploaded, um, but uh, we have some tutorial videos from this summer that I'm going to put up on YouTube, um, you know, if you want to check those out for yourself or for students working with you. Um, and, uh, you know, just a few sort of screen grabs here. Um, detecting Voyager 1 at the ACA. I always love detecting Voyager 1, firstly because it's... Uh, 20 billion kilometers away and it's got a 20 watt transmitter um, and uh, you know we, we, we can pick that up um, which I think is really neat and secondly um, you know this is a, a sort of stand-in for uh, a real techno signature right it's, it's in the outer solar system I mean we still got to go you know maybe 100,000 times further away to reach the nearest stars so the power requirements go up uh, you know a fair bit um, but it it gives us this demonstration that this is possible that these detections of, uh, of these signals from vast distances are possible with the equipment that we have which I think is really cool uh, I mentioned already, you know, SETI Institute and GNU Radio have joined forces. So um, SETI Institute handles uh, the the contracts and grants and 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 all of this uh, um, sort of um, uh, support uh, for for the GNU Radio project. And again, this this is available to you, um, you know, in in this room if you have ideas uh, for proposals that you want to put in. Um, we've also used GNU Radio at, at outreach events that we've done, um, again, sort of both with the SETI Institute and, and with Berkeley SETI, um, some, some good stuff uh, that DeepSig helped us out with at a couple of exhibits and people sort of seeing these uh, sort of hands-on uh, DSP applications and realizing that these can be applied to the search for life, I think is um, you know, a powerful message that we can get across the public. So again, uh, you know, Tony Beasley is going to talk uh, tomorrow, I think, because mostly about um, satellite constellations and radio astronomy. But uh, for those of you who've seen the movie Contact, um, the, the Jodie Foster character here, I think, uh, inspired at least in part by, uh, by Jill Tarter at the SETI Institute. Um, we're still not sort of really plugging in the headphones to the array and kind of, uh, you know, listening for stuff. Um, I think sort of the, the Breakthrough Listen project has maybe not, not helped very much as well with the idea that, uh, you know, we're not actually listening, of course. We're doing, um, you know, digital signal processing and detection and anomaly detection. Um, but there is actually now going to be a project for the first time uh, that is going to do SETI on the VLA, and this is driven out of the SETI Institute in collaboration with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, a uh, rather contrived acronym, the Commensal Open Source Multimode Interferometer Cluster Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or COSMIC. 
Uh, and again, this is the first use of the VLA for SETI. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, Tony's probably not going to give you um, large amounts of time on the VLA to do your science, but the power of this uh, uh, instrument that, that's being developed at the SETI Institute is that it's going to do commensal observations, essentially. Uh, so commensal is sort of eating at the same table, basically. So you've got a primary user who's pointing the telescope, maybe looking at the pulsar and the green beam in the center, and then you can simultaneously do beam forming uh, that phases up on other targets in, in the field um, that are of interest uh, for the SETI searches. And we can do that processing completely independently without interfering with the primary user. And again, this is uh, you know really uh, a win-win. Mentioned the outreach stuff. So um, Seth's radio show, uh, the big picture science, um, uh, SETI talks, lectures, a lot of these are streamed uh, live. There's also some Facebook live stuff. Um, uh, there's been some great work with artists in residence at the SETI Institute. Uh, you know, if, if you are or if you know of, of artists that will be interested in taking part in that, again, um, Rebecca can fill you in on the details. Uh, education. Um, so the um, SOFIA telescope 747 with a big hole cut in the side, um, that, that mission is, uh, is winding down uh, now, but the SETI Institute has been instrumental in uh, training high school science teachers, actually flying them up on, um, on the SOFIA mission. Uh, and also leading this uh, space science program for Girl Scouts in partnership with the University of Arizona and the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Uh, so, you know, a few statistics about how many uh, interns have been reached, how many teachers have been reached. Um, and then, you know, again, these sort of broader partnerships um, that are really, I, I think, having an impact. He may have come across um, FDL uh, at some point. So this is a public-private partnership um, focused on AI and machine learning and its overlap with space science. Again, this doesn't have to be SETI. You know, I'm wearing my sort of, you know, techno signature search hat here, but there's a lot of programs that go on sort of across the sciences uh, where there's mutual interest between the private partners that come in and supply um, some funding and some expertise and then the academics uh, that team up um, over the course of the program. So um, deep learning meets deep science um, and bringing new synergies for areas of research that NASA is interested in. So this was conceived by the Office of the Chief Technologist at NASA headquarters to explore the applicability of AI and ML to NASA research priorities, uh, how we can get interdisciplinary teams working on short time horizons, and the ability of public-private partnerships to accelerate these uh, sort of better, faster, cheaper objectives that drive a lot of what NASA does. So partnering um, with early career PhDs in AI and ML, early career PhDs in space research, and then getting these mentors in AI and, uh, and science, um, subject matter experts, NASA stakeholders, industry partners, and academia. Um, it's a real kind of fun sort of you know, startup culture program, an eight-week summer research accelerator, which leverages these teams for an extensive sort of summer workshop kind of hack uh, uh, fest um, and uh, runs from late June to late August, uh, starting with a boot camp at NVIDIA, ending with team presentations at Intel, uh, and um, again, driven sort of out of Mountain View, California by the SETI Institute and its presence there and uh, the NASA Ames Center. Um, so some examples of um, some, uh, some of the topics here, uh, modeling of asteroid shapes, finding long period comets, forecasting solar behavior, uh, enabling auto autonomous uh, navigation for, for exploration, and uh, dealing with the sort of um, the, the, the deluge of data that we have to deal with in, in, uh, in modern science and engineering. SETI Institute was selected to host and administer the FDL program because of the history of the Institute supporting NASA research, existing cooperative agreements, the proximity to and relationships with uh, the, the NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley, and the ability to engage private companies, explore partnership opportunities, and the science mentors um, to support these investigations, particularly into near-Earth objects and planetary defense. Um, I mentioned grant proposals. So, uh, um, you know, NASA's interested in supporting um, the, the, the search. And actually, uh, the, um, the, the Congress just passed the Chips and Science Act. And it's interesting that called out in that is that the administrator may support, as appropriate, merit-reviewed, competitively selected research on techno signatures. So even, uh, you know, the Congress is kind of realizing that, um, you know, the, the, the sort of out in the cold aspects of, of SETI um, from a decade or two ago, it's really time to, to change that. Uh, we've had some grants through the SETI Institute. My colleague Anne-Marie Cody at the SETI, SETI Institute is um, PI on a grant that's looking for anomalies uh, in, in time series data from the test mission. Um, you know, there's weird things that you find in data that are not necessarily aliens. And in fact, sort of the last explanation that we tend to go to is, you know, it's probably aliens, right? We, we want to rule out all the other um, possibilities first. But there's some interesting astrophysics, some interesting science that comes out of anomaly detection more broadly 
some interesting applications, um, you know, to to other areas of research. Uh, and so, um, you know, NASA's back in the game. Um, you know, if you want to put in grants that are actually in this area of techno signature research, the SETI Institute is a, a, a great place to do that. Um, but also, you know, it's a great place to bring your GNU radio uh, proposals. Um, so uh, several of the, the folks in uh, the, the, the project leads for GNU radio uh, are now running uh, an ARDC grant through the SETI Institute. And, and you too, you know, can bring your grants. Again, talk to Rebecca. She's the, the expert on this. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we'd be happy to engage with you. So, um, you know, are we alone? Well, uh, you know, the, there are a few areas, I think, um, where we can, we can work together. Technical development, for example, um, on the ATA, uh, education uh, using GNU Radio that I mentioned, Frontier Development Lab, proposing for grants, and then any other sort of ideas uh, that you may have. And I think that's my last slide, so I'd be happy to take a few questions. Thanks. Any questions in the audience for Dr. Croft? Yes, over here. So I apologize if you get this question all the time, but what's your preferred solution to the Fermi paradox? <laughs> yeah, the Fermi paradox, um, which I didn't mention, basically sort of if um, if the aliens are out there, then why haven't we heard from them? Um, you know, I think we probably haven't looked hard enough. I mean, I'm a sort of I'm a little bit agnostic as to whether they're out there or not. I think our job is to kind of go out there and put constraints on it. Um, uh, you know, we didn't know of any planets outside the solar system. Uh, you know, when I was in elementary school, and now you know, as I say, we know that there are many billions of them in the galaxy. So it may just be a matter of having the right tools, the right techniques, um, you know, the right sort of um, uh, ideas as to to where we should look. Um, so. You know, I mean, I I don't think there are, you know, large numbers of uh, of alien civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy. I think there are some sort of, you know, at the, at the high end, there are some constraints that we already have put on that. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't want to go sort of much further than that in saying we've really sort of done a good enough job at this point to um, to, to rule much of that parameter space out. But we're, we're trying. 